what was happening in um, you know uh, the fifties with Ed Sullivan uh, into the the sixties. That was the main uh, show that everybody watched for all their entertainment, and the new bands got broken on that show. Uh, and um, when Ed Sullivan put Elvis on, that was 1956, and his drummer was a great drummer named DJ Fontana. And DJ was coming from the swing jazz background where drummers held their sticks uh, in sort of a, a marching field drum position. The stick was, uh, in the left hand was like this, and it had this angle to play on, on marching drums. That's where that started, and then jazz drummers and swing drummers kept playing uh, like that. Um, every now and then they would switch this left hand to match the right hand for power and DJ found himself in the middle of the birth of rock and roll and he was going back and forth from a swing feel and attitude to a strong heavy backbeat so he would switch grips you see him on Ed Sullivan in some of those clips playing like this and then playing like this and he was in the middle of that transition he was the drummer that represented that transition to millions of people so then when the Beatles came on the Ed Sullivan show in February of 64, um, and everybody saw Ringo, as, as compared to DJ, DJ was on the floor behind Elvis, pretty much hidden. You couldn't see him very well. It was all about Elvis, and he had a backup band. Then when the Beatles came on, this was a whole other situation. Now the drummer is on a riser that's about six, I don't know, five feet up and he's towering over these other three musicians that are in front of him. And immediately you realize this drummer is an equal. This is a band. This isn't a star with some backing musicians. This drummer is an equal part of this band, and he's really got something to say. And look how great it is. He's up on this pedestal. And Ringo is playing not back and forth, but Ringo has embraced holding both sticks with the match grip you know, because this is hard rock and roll and he's got to lay this beat down and there was no forgiveness, there was uh, no apologies, it was let's go for it. And he's smiling and grinning, having a great time, obviously that hair's flying and he's sloshing around on those cymbals and crashing and, and just, he was just a visual uh, feast. But the point is, is that Ringo in one night changed the way drummers approach the instrument because of his attitude, the way he held the sticks, the fact that he was up in the air on this pedestal and was clearly an equal to the rest of the musicians and was an important part of this whole package. So Ringo's presence was just, you know, it was, uh, it was really staggering. So, so what a lot of people didn't realize that night or those nights watching the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show was that um, you know, there was a great amount of musicality and, and, you know, experience going on within that performance. You know, it was easy to focus on the hair and the silliness and the girls screaming and all of that. But these guys, without Ringo, had been playing, you know, for, for a few years, uh, you know, eight-hour gigs and things like that in Germany and, and Liverpool. You know, Ringo had all sorts of musicality going on. There are 15-year-old drummers right now that can do, the th do things on the drums, acrobatics on the drums that Ringo couldn't begin to do. But that's not the point. Uh, the point is, is that Ringo was, was creating a new sound with the way he was playing, and he was, he was going away from the jazz swing era. But his mu musicality is really the bottom line. When people say, Oh, uh, Ringo's not a great drummer. Um, you know, you can you can understand that a little bit because it's not like he's doing really fast, intricate, uh, uh, you know, flashy kind of stuff on the drums. That was never what Ringo was about. He never cares. For, you know, he never cared for that. Playing drum solos, he only played one drum solo in all the recorded material of the Beatles, and that's on side two of Abbey Road, and it's only an eight-bar drum solo. But the the, the thing about Ringo's eight-bar drum solo is that you can put a metronome to that drum solo and it will stay with this metronome for the eight bars. In other words, he's not rushing and he's not dragging and where it starts, eight bars later, it will finish with that metronome. So Ringo had nearly perfect time 
And that was so critical, so important to the Beatles because they would go in the studio and they would record songs and they would do 20, 25, 30 takes sometimes of a song. And later they would edit that song together and they would do this without a metronome, without a click track. It was not metronomically perfect like so many bands do today. But they would take maybe, you know, the chorus from take three and the bridge from take uh, 12 and edit these pieces together. And because Ringo was so solid, his time was so good, and his consistency about how he played the drums and the parts and the musicality to those parts, uh, they would all come together like a, you know, just this, like a beautiful tapestry. And, um, and you know, Ringo just had this innate ability to play what was right for the song. And, and it didn't take too long before producers in, in the United States and everywhere else started realizing that Ringo's feel and his sound and his approach to playing the drums was really the template for pop music, you know, for the next 30 years by virtue of the fact that he created a new sound, he created a style, he created an attitude uh, and a feel for playing the drums. All of that came out of his deep musicianship.